In this epilogue series, we've talked about the nations that formed after the World War, we've talked about the peace treaties that ended the war, and we've talked about the disaster of the Spanish flu that colored the post-war world. But what of the individuals who fought the war that I've talked about for over four years? What became of them? I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War epilogue special. The match that lit the tinderbox of Europe that flared into the World War was the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand by Gavrilo Princip. Princip died in prison of tuberculosis in April 1918. He had been too young to receive the death penalty. His only regret was also shooting the Archduke's wife. The final emperor of the empire Princip despised, Karl I, himself died of pneumonia after his exile at just 35. The Austrian chief of staff, who was a major architect of the war, Franz Konrad von Hotzendorf, went to Germany to live and spend the remainder of his days writing memoirs. German Kaiser Wilhelm remained in the Netherlands in exile until dying in 1940. According to G.J. Meyer in A World Undone, at the end, he was putting pins in maps to mark the progress of the German army. His former army leader, Erich Ludendorff, returned to Germany from exile in Sweden to become involved in not one, but two failed coup attempts, the second with Adolf Hitler in 1923. He ran unsuccessfully for German president in 1925. Ludendorff's chief of staff, Paul von Hindenburg, came out of retirement to actually win that election. By 1932, when he was in his 80s, he ran again to give some alternative to Hitler. He won again, but a year later appointed Hitler as chancellor. Paul von Lettau Vorbeck refused to work with Hitler because of his hatred for politics, even though he had supported the 1923 coup and led his Freikorps paramilitary unit. There were those who figured prominently in the war who did not survive its end for too many years. American President Woodrow Wilson left the White House when Warren G. Harding took over in 1921. By then, he was disabled by a stroke. He died in 1924, his League of Nations rejected by his country. Lenin had also been disabled by a cerebral hemorrhage and also died in 1924. Alexander Kerensky, who headed the government Lenin replaced, lived in exile for the rest of his life in Paris and New York. He died in 1970. The great Russian general Alexei Brusilov continued to serve the army the Red Army, until 1924. Ferdinand Foch was made Marshal of France, but withdrew from public life, much like France's Chief of Staff when the war began, Joseph Joffre. Germany's second Chief of Staff, Erich von Falkenhayn, did likewise. Italy's first Chief of Staff, Luigi Cadorna, who had lost his post in disgrace after Caporetto, was nevertheless made Field Marshal by Benito Mussolini. Sir Douglas Haig was given £100,000 by Parliament after the war, but never became Britain's Chief of Staff. He worked raising money for veterans until he died in 1928. British Chief of Staff Henry Wilson left the army. He became a member of Parliament and was murdered on his doorstep by the IRA. Wally Robertson, whom Wilson had replaced as Chief of Staff, led British occupation troops in Germany. And when he became field marshal, he also became the only British soldier ever to work his way up from private to field marshal. As for Jeffrey Spicer Simpson, natives in the Lake Tanganyika region built stone and clay statues to him. A fetish figure of him can be found in the National Museum of Dar es Salaam, complete with skirt and tattoos. He was a translator at Versailles and died in 1947. John Monash oversaw the demobilization of his troops, returned to Australia, and worked in different civil positions, such as Vice Chancellor of Melbourne University. Arthur Curry also became a University Vice Chancellor of McGill University in Canada. Interesting thing I found about him in A World Undone. He faded into inexplicably deep obscurity. His name does not appear in the Macmillan Dictionary of the First World War, a hefty volume that gives substantial attention to the likes of Admiral Alexander Kolchak and Ante Trumbic of Croatia. Well, he got plenty of attention here. John Pershing became Chief of Staff of the United States Army post-war, 
and eventually wrote his memoirs, which won the 1932 Pulitzer Prize for History. One military leader of the Great War who played a huge role post-war was Mustafa Kemal. After again being a war hero in the Greco-Turkish War, he became president of the new state of Turkey, and also became Ataturk, the father of the Turkish people. Philippe Piton had a big role post-war as well, unfortunately for him. When Germany invaded France in 1940, he was asked to form a government. It was he who arranged an armistice and served as head of state of Vichy France. Post-World War II, he was condemned to death, but the sentence was commuted to life in prison. He died in 1951 at 95. Winston Churchill, the architect of Gallipoli and the dreamer of the tank, was also head of state in World War II, earning his greatest glory as Britain's prime minister. David Lloyd George, British Prime Minister during the Great War, lost his post in 1922. French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau resigned his post after losing a bid for president. He then spent the rest of his life traveling the world doing crazy and fun stuff until his death at 88 in 1929. One man who also spent time traveling the world, though because he was forced to, was Leon Trotsky. After losing a power struggle to Joseph Stalin, he was eventually exiled from the Soviet Union in 1929. Perpetually on the run after that from Stalin's agents, they finally killed him in Mexico with either an axe or an ice pick in 1940. Enver Pasha also ended up on the run, first to Germany, then to Moscow, and finally to Turkestan, where he took command of the anti-Bolshevik rebels and was killed in the fighting. As for the other two of the three Pashas, Jamal Pasha was assassinated in 1922 in retaliation for his role in the Armenian Genocide. Talat Pasha had been similarly killed a year earlier. And so it goes, for everyone has a story. Great or small, private or general, munitions worker to flying ace, everyone who served in the Great War in any capacity has a story to tell. And those stories should be told and they should be listened to, not just to learn of heroism or determination or even cowardice, but to learn for those stories are the stories on which our world is built. And if we don't listen to those stories and don't learn from them, then we are perhaps condemned to repeat the colossal and tragic errors of the past. If you've now watched our entire series or just want to get an idea of where this all started, you can click right here for our very first episode. See ya.